Okay, quick summary of some of the stuff I told you uh, in lab. Um, <clears throat> and we went over this in lab, so I'm going to go around quickly here. Uh, we have a magnet, and we have some field lines coming out of it right here. Okay, and they go from the say the positive side around to the negative side. Okay, now if the magnetic field it, it's not charged. Okay, uh, but if we have a whole bunch of electric dipoles lined up like this, the lines will look pretty much the same. Okay, uh, so it's worth understanding that. Uh, and then you know the blue arrows represent the direction field. Everybody's had differential equations. You know what the direction field is. At every point, gives you the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, the density of the lines is proportional to the strength of the field. So you see the lines along this loop, of this line is pretty close to this line, and the lines start out equally spaced. And of course, they're distributed across the surface. I've only drawn them in one dimension because the whole picture would get untenable if I did. Uh, but anyhow, the uh, the lines are close here. Magnetic field's greater. Okay. <clears throat> um, down here, the field lines are spaced a little further apart, and actually, this loop should have gone down lower uh, because things are going to get further. These these two circles or these two paths are going to get further and further apart as we move down. So this one should have been maybe down about there, so that the distance is down where it makes sense. But you still get the idea uh, that the magnetic field is going to decrease in magnitude as we go around here. Uh, then it's going to increase as we come back here, and the orange brown arrows indicate the actual magnetic field. So that we have a magnetic flux emanating out of this. So if we put a rectangle, an equal rectangle out here, it'll intersect most of these field lines. So the, if, if, if the rectangle is very close to this one, only the field lines very close to the edge fail to pass through the loop. So when most of them pass through pretty close to perpendicular, which means that the magnetic flux just a little ways outside the loop, it's pretty much going to equal the magnetic flux right at the surface. Okay. Now we should understand that flux is the magnitude of the field strength times the cosine of the angle with normal. It's a dot product of the magnetic field with the uh, area. Okay. So I don't want to process that whole idea. Okay. Now. We used a simplified model just to understand what happens when we rotate a magnet inside a set of pinholes closed. In the simplified model, the field just came out straight. It didn't loop around. Okay. That's not realistic, but it helps visualize what's happening. So we have a magnet, and let's, I don't want to use just one of the ceramic magnets because it's kind of small. The illustration. With this closed, okay. Let's just pretend this is a mag, and here's your positive side. So your field's coming out perpendicular in this direction. Field lines are doing what? Well, actually, they're looping around like this, and then looping, well, looping, yeah, around like this, and then around like this, and around like this, okay. And then up here, they're going in the opposite. Well, they are going around like this, okay. We have a flux. So if I, let's say, put a rectangle in front of this thing, okay, that rectangle is going to intercept most of the flux lines. It's a very good rectangle. Okay. Now, if I get a little further away, a whole lot of flux lines will escape that rectangle. They'll loop all the way around. They won't go through. You're not going to get much flux. Okay. Um. And if we do a smaller rectangle, let's just say the picture instead of the whole board, well, we're going to intercept not quite as many flux lines. We'll still intercept most of them. Like right here, we'll probably intercept 99% of them. 
even with a, a smaller rectangle. Now, if the rectangle becomes much smaller, so where let's say it's the same size as our magnet. Now, this rectangle is just an imaginary rectangle in space. This is a magnet. This is an imaginary rectangle in space. They look the same, but no. Okay, so if this imaginary rectangle in space is right next to the magnet, then we're going to intercept most of the field lines. And we're going to intercept most of them at a pretty close but perpendicular to this surface. So we're going to get a lot of flux. Okay, go a little further. Well, we're going to miss some of them. And some of them are going to be already looping up, not quite perpendicular to this surface. And the amount of flux that we intercept is going to decrease rapidly as we move this thing away. Now, in the Helmholtz coils, and I'm not going to bring them over here because it's the wrong scale, uh, but you know, we have loops like here and loops on this side. So, what happens? To the magnet inside. Well, the loops are fairly close compared to the dimensions of the magnet. So if we rotate the magnet from this orientation to this orientation, where the magnetic field is coming out parallel to the loops, well, we do get some field around this way, and we'll intercept a bit of the loop when we're out here. But when this thing is aimed at the in the direction of the axis and sitting at the center of the loop, we kind of get a maximum. And you, you could set it up, you know, there's all the variable calculus integrals that you can do, but you really don't want to mess with them. Uh, they have to be approximated. They're kind of difficult and maybe a little bit hard to write. We might look at that a little bit later just to get the idea of how you would set up those integrals, okay? Not really that complicated except for some of the details. Okay, well, anyhow. Okay, so if the direction of the loops is here, and we suddenly move this thing, then we get a quick change or slow change in the flux through these loops. And of course, a field line that comes out here through the loop is going to come back here and through the other loop, and field is going to go through this loop in this direction, it's going to come into this loop in this direction, so we're going to reinforce. The loops are set up so that that happens. Uh, you can have the loops where the current flows this way and this one and same direction on the other, just depending on how you run your wires, or it could be opposite. Okay, this direction here, this direction here. You can figure out which one is going to give you the maximum. All right, well, that's a little bit about the magnetic field stuff. You want to be able to calculate. Now, we just did a sample calculation. 2,000 Gauss is 0.2 Tesla field. Gauss is 10 to the negative fourth Tesla. The flux through the close magnet or the close loop, uh, that would be like, okay, this thing's really close, then the flux is just going to be the flux that comes out of this thing which will be equal to the magnetic field times the area, okay? In general, it's the magnetic field times the area times your normal. You know, it's a dot product of the magnetic field with your normal. If you're very close, if your, loops are very, if your loop is very close to the surface, Vectors will always be normal. And this approximation, wherever it comes out in a straight line, works. Um, but this is mostly just a mechanism, uh, I think it's a better word for it, for kind of understanding that the flux kind of goes out this way. And I used an analogy with a flashlight that you might think of. Uh, but really, it's like this. Okay, it's not waving my hands over this. I don't want to go into too much detail. But anyhow, we calculated the flux through one surface. And but that, that means through one surface of the magnet. And here it is. Uh, and since 
the surface is normal to itself, then the flux dotted with the normal vector, the magnetic field dotted with the normal vector is just a magnetic field. Multiply that by the area, and we get magnetic flux, 2,000 Gauss centimeters squared. Well, and if Gauss is 10 to the negative fourth Tesla, so we are 10 to the negative fourth meter squared. So we get like two times 10 to the negative fourth Tesla meters squared. God, this is a two times 10 to the fourth, this is 10 to the negative fourth, leaving us a 10 to the negative fourth. Uh, and that's called uh, the Tesla meter squared, it's called a Weber. Okay. Or Weber, if you want to use German pronunciation of Weber's name. <laughs> okay. Uh, and we get a hold of it and call it a Weber. Uh, so, again, we just kind of illustrated the rectangle, the flux, and all that stuff. Nothing new that I didn't just wave my hands over to understand this picture. Uh, and, you know, these dotted lines are mostly just there to indicate that this thing is separated from your magnet. Uh, and out here is the actual loop, and maybe that should be clarified. So here's your loop. That's chopped right. Okay, here's your loop. Okay, here's your loop. Look out. Okay, now that's using the model where the flux comes straight out. In the actual model, some of the field lines escape. Uh, and the magnetic field is not always perpendicular. So you got to take that uh, into consideration. Um, using the simplified model, though, we're going to assume the whole flux escapes. The coils, the loops in the heavens. And then we calculate the change in flux. If we go from flux equals VA, which is what it is, if the magnet is oriented parallel to the axis, to zero if it's oriented here. Now, again, that's using the model where everything comes out of here straight instead of looping around. Loops around that makes all your flux is a little bit smaller. Okay. Now, if this changes in a tenth of a second, what's the rate of change in flux? Well, it's easy to calculate. Uh, it's 0.1 second denominator to so get 10 here. Uh, and you get negative 10 times. Magnetic field times your area per second. Uh, and if VA is this, then you get this rate. And you get 0 0.4 volts, which is about 10 times what we actually measured. And we haven't really reconciled that. I don't understand what it was the average if the nuclear phase is getting here in time. Okay. Uh, really kind of try to nail that down a little bit before our next lab we can get notes. Okay. A final thing. Uh, so well, that's the picture. And of course, we did more stuff with flux in class, talked about the magnetic moment to find that. So today, I'll shift gears a little bit to talk about source of magnetic field. Where's the magnetic field come from? We've dealt with what happens when a charge moves through a magnetic field. Remember that was. Magnetic force equals Q times V cross P. Okay. Or IL cross. And then whether you have like a current and length of wire or just a single charge. And the current takes care of the charge times the velocity in a way that we more or less talked about last time. And I'll talk about a little bit more. Um, right now, you're going to rely on the equations, the formulas, and you can read how these relate. It's just basic common sense with the conduction of 
very simple. I kind of said it before, watch this. Uh, but you probably want to process that a little more if you want to understand this, especially going to be an electrical engineer. Okay, now, uh, some areas of electrical engineering, you don't need as much of this as others do. You pretty much need it in every one. Okay, if you go heavy into the theory, which one of our students last year is doing, um, you really want to know. <laughs> All right. Well, that's what we did last time. This time, we're going to look at I don't know whether I got the cursor or something. Uh, a little bit of both. Apparently. Source of magnetic field. Let's make sure that's the thing, not a magnet. That is the first, but there it is. Okay. What's our source of magnetic field? Well, if we have a charge, moving at velocity v, then we have the vector. Okay. Let's say here's our vector Q V. And we have a point out here. Point P. Now, I started talking about R vectors back when we did gravitation. So you should be very familiar with R vectors. And we did it again with Coulomb. So, okay. The R vector. So important. Okay. Here's our R vector. The magnetic field at B, at P, Number Q. Velocity is times Q V. I think it's QV cross R divided by R. This is the unit vector in direction R times R squared. Now let's see if this makes sense. Okay, this is like we've got a current in this direction, and we do a cross product to the vector in this direction. And it gives us a field in this direction. And that's not consistent with what the right hand, yeah, it is consistent. The right hand rule tells us that a current in this direction, field has to curl around this way, loop around this way. So that is consistent. So I believe that's right. I'm going to double check it against the text because they think to do that really. Okay. So I could have it backwards. It's something I had backwards on flux too, but haven't really used that much. I just used it to calculate the magnitude of the field in the lab for the magnitude of the voltage uh, <clears throat> because we weren't distinguishing the direction of the current. Okay. Um, that's my excuse that I just wrote it down, Carol. Okay. Um, so I think this is correct. Now, 
what this says is that this is an inverse square law of the constant, just like k, okay, q1, q2 over r squared, or like g for g, m1, m2 over r squared, just look, another inverse square law, okay? But with a little bit of a twist. QV is our source of magnetic field. It's a cross product with R, which means sine of theta here is going to have something to do with this. Okay? If you had a point at equal distance up here, the field would be greater here than it would here because of this I. Okay? We'll see more about that. But V cross R is magnitude of V, magnitude of R sine theta, in one direction with the right hand rule, right? So the sine theta comes in with this, okay? So out in front of this charge, there's zero magnetic field at any point along the line of motion, okay? That's worth simple, okay? Now this R divided by R is a unit vector. I prefer to write it like this than to put an R cubed in the denominator, which makes it look like an inverse cube law if you're not looking at it critically. And whoever looks at anything critically in a physics class, the first time they see it, <laughs> okay? You just don't do it. Some people might, okay? I'm not going to insult anybody who does. Uh, it's just that I can't expect that you're going to look at it all that critically. Therefore, I like to write this as a unit vector, and then it's an inverse square law. Now, I'm going to double check this just to be sure I'm telling the little thing correctly and have the cross product in the right direction. Um, and make sure I'm not misleading you, because if you get misled from the very beginning, it's hard to recover from that. Uh, and the only thing I'll note, uh, the text did this nicely. They did write it as an inverse square. Sometimes you see it written down here as an R cube. And in multivariable calculus especially, there's a lot of expressions that obscure the real nature of the interaction. Uh, Okay, R over R is R half, so you see an R half there instead of R vector over one, two, four. Okay, other than that, it's correct. Okay, well, that's not a difficult. Oh, yeah, K prime is easy to remember. to the negative seven in SI units. Now, what are the SI units? Well, this is Coulomb meters per second divided by square meter, okay? Which means Now, this is in units of Tesla. Now, I've got Tesla meters per amp. Oh, that's right. I didn't like about that. Okay. Because you're going to have a meter per second divided by a meter squared gives you a meter in the denominator here. So if you're going to get Tesla, you better have a meter in the numerator of your unit. And process that if you didn't understand it. Okay, or write it out yourself and see what it has to be. And then you have Coulomb over second from Coulomb meters per second. You've got a Coulomb per second, which is an amp in the numerator. So you better have an amp in the denominator. And if you do, then the units all come out so that you end up with force in test or field in test. Okay. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. Now, what do you do if you have a current in the water? Because one of the things we looked at in lab last time. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Okay, that's good. 
slight interruption there to tell me maybe I wasn't recording, but actually, unusually, I actually was. Okay. Uh, now, one of the things we looked at in lab, and I think we probably have the apparatus right here. Uh, we suspend an aluminum strip kind of like this with a little bit of slack in it. As we make it really tight, it's harder to see the interaction. We suspend this with a magnet very close under the low point. And we put a current through this thing. Well, if the current's going in this direction and the magnet's laying flat here, the magnetic field is vertical. Maybe up, maybe down. Okay. Uh, and we can determine whether it was up or down because we can use batteries and we know what the polarity is that creates a circuit, okay? It creates a current, sorry. Um, so if we find, and then this thing deflects, when we put six volts on the thing, uh, that magnetic strip just deflects very quickly out to a point. Okay. Uh, and then there are other things we do. Uh, somebody came up with the same idea I came up with, and they came up with a lot quicker than I did when I started thinking about it years ago. Okay. Uh, you just suspend the thing like this and put a little weight on it, and then start measuring the deflection. Okay. And that allows you to measure, uh, not, not real accurately because. Uh, The current is not at a uniform distance from the source of the magnetic field. And the magnetic field isn't constant, although it's fairly close in the region that you get close to. So you, you gotta make estimates, but I would say you should be able to get a ballpark estimate within maybe a factor of two that tells you how the magnetic field interacts with the current. Okay. Um so it's an ex excellent idea. It can be refined a little bit, and anybody who's going to be a mechanical engineer ought to think, oh, okay, how would you refine that? Just given what we have here in the lab, which is not much. Okay? Um, it, it, as far as doing this experiment. Now, there's an apparatus for this thing that bypasses all the design questions. Okay? I don't think you learn. The physics all that well. I don't think you learn stuff that's not helping you be a good engineer just by using canned equipment. Uh, yeah. there, there are advantages to using it all. So you get precise measurements and you learn how to use precise equipment to get with a precise degree. So there, there are advantages both ways. Okay, and the uh, rambling. Uh, what we want to do, uh, do uh, what we want to do. To understand what's going on here, we just want to say, okay, we've got a current. So we've got some kind of a current carry. Let's say it's a wire. And we got a current I. And we got a point here. Okay. How do we get? magnetic field at this point because what I was just talking about was forced on a conductor which is basically this which we've already done so I was talking about something we did last time you know I was talking about the force in that thing okay uh, early on you know, weeks ago Remember, we had current flowing through a wire, and we put a compass over it, and it deflected. Remember that? Okay. And we put a compass under it, and it deflects in the opposite direction. Okay. If you don't remember that, just remind me to end a class and take 10 seconds to do it. Okay. And we actually got the battery and that strip there, so we can actually do some kind of interesting. But 
What's happening there is the magnetic field is exerting a torque on the compass needle. Now, the compass needle wants to point north, which is about there. Okay, so it takes a torque to move it away from that. If there was no magnetic field of the earth, any torque at all would take the magnetic magnet needle. Okay, and move it 90 degrees from the direction of the curve. Okay. So we want to kind of understand that. We want to kind of analyze it so we can observe it in, in lab next time. Okay. Uh, so we want the magnetic field at P, just kind of like we had it if we have a QV cross V, right? Okay. QV cross, QV cross R. Well, we've got charges, more or less continuously distributed through this wire. Okay. So that the charges in a typical section of wire. Number 90% of physics at this level. Comes down to what happens to a typical increment, then it gets summed up and gives you the okay. So we've got a typical increment of length of delta L. And we'll give it a direction. So delta L becomes that. Then field F P. Due to the charge due to the moving charges in the delta L increment, but I'll just say since the moving charges give you current. The field of P due to the current in delta L is K prime I delta L. Cross R pad or R squared. This is the same as this except that a QV is equivalent to an I delta L for reasons you really want to understand upon. Okay, so very simple then, our picture has I delta L. Okay, little thing, but I think you can see it. Now, I delta L is the vector has been drawn longer than the delta L increment. Now, we can draw it any length we want since I delta L is going to be of different dimension than delta L. Delta L is in SI units of meters, I delta L is in amp meters, right? And how big is an amp meter compared to a meter? As big as you want to make it. Or small. So I've chosen to make I delta L this long just so I can draw it. Let's, let's it. Okay. Then we have an R vector. Okay. 
Um, It's sum over all delta L increments. Oh. Yes. I've written it this way with the K prime I here. K prime is constant. Your current in the water is constant. So that'll come outside the sum. And you're only summing up your delta L cross R uh, over R squared, right? Okay. It's a sum over all your delta L difference, which approaches K prime I times the interval over your interval. I thought that you might. Oh. I'm going to call this not DL cross R, not delta L cross R. There it is. Not a very difficult expression to write, except now let's work in the details. Okay, so. So let's assume you have, okay, let's say here's your one. And you got a current that's flowing this way. And we're going to right now ignore any contribution from these two parts of the wire and only the contribution what I call the horizontal part of the wire. And we're going to make P That's closer to the horizontal wire than to the amps. Okay. So it's kind of near the middle and not too far from the wire. Well, what do we do now? We partition this part of the wire. Again, and then we're going to put coordinates on this. We're going to assume an x axis. And let's say we're going to let x equal zero at the center. Yeah, we'll say x equals zero halfway, which is right. And we're going to let the wire have length L. So the wire goes from x equals negative L over 2 to x equals L over 2. 
so we partition. Well, before I partition, let me point out that I just did a typical increment here, right? I didn't put any coordinates on it. I didn't have a partition. Implicitly, it's an interval in a partition. Okay? And we get this, which is most of what we need. Now, the other thing we need is we do need to put some symbols or numbers on this wire. Is it finite wire? How do we want to model it? Well, I chose to model it so that x equals zero at the center of the wire. Okay. And we got a current I. We got a point P. Now, the only other thing we want is coordinates for P. So P equals X, Y. Now, there are strains on X, Y. Remember, we've got to be a lot closer to the wire than to the ends. And, and the reason for that is that way we can ignore the contributions of the current here and the current here. Okay. Uh, so we want a partition. Interval over two, over two. So we've got negative L over two less or equal to X naught less or equal to X one, so forth. Not less or equal to less than, and all the way out to uh, X sub M equals L over two. Well, typical increment. I minus one less than X I star less than X I. So your R vector equals X minus X naught star times your I vector plus Y sub I star times your general. Because y equals zero on your x axis, so y equals zero at any point, any sample point, in any input. Okay. So on this increment, again. We have I go with L. We have a point P. We have our vector. R equals A little bit small, although it should show perfectly well. Have a video on reasonable size screen. Okay. So there it is. The
still the same. That's point two. It's just five. I build a hell for our square. There it is. Same thing. He wrote. Okay. Here's your R vector. Your I build a hell. I didn't quite out what that might be. Is I times del S sub I. Which equals I don't know how we can see by that. But what's the confusing issue? Hopefully you understand that. Hopefully we get that a little answer. But okay. So this is K prime I, which I'll write over here because it's going to factor out. It's the same everyone in the bottom times delta L, which is delta XI times your I vector because it's in the direction of your X axis. Cross. And it's going to be this, and I'm going to put an R2 down. Not trying to obscure anything, but I've got to have an R over R here, and I've got an R square here, and that does amount to an R cube. And the third R is just because you have to divide this vector by its magnitude. And we can find out. Instructed that. Just write this as a cross product of this. And then I'll put my arm cube down here. And one more set of analysis to make sure take the cross product of the whole vector. Well, that equals a prime i. <clears throat> write out the whole determinant thing if you want to. But i cross i is zero, and i cross j is k. And of course, we're going to have the k vector and the k prime, so you don't want to confuse those. But that's just going to give you y i star delta x i over r q, which is y r q. X minus X I star squared plus Y I star squared raised to three halves power. And if you haven't encountered a lot of three halves power, it would use Coulomb's law and all a lot of other stuff. I'd be surprised, okay? And you would have encountered it quite a bit in the calculus course. 
too, so virtual development is important. Okay. Uh, and then all that finds your payback. Well, your x axis is in this direction. If it's right handed coordinate system, your y axis is in this direction. So i cross j is k. So your field is coming out of the board, which is consistent with the field that we have directly above a wire where the field, where the current is in this direction. By the right hand rule, your thumb goes in this direction, your fingers curl around. By the time they get up there, they're pointing straight at you. Okay. Now, probably some of all your delicacies. Which approaches a prime i times the integral over the partition over the end, you know, from one end of the partition to the other, so it's negative L over two to L over two from here to here of Got a notation disaster on my hands here. But I thought about that and decided it didn't make any difference because I was not quite seeing the end. Okay, for all these expressions, it's all good. But now what I do at delta x, then we have an ambiguity between xi star and x because we're going to use x for both of them. We take the limit. So I've got to change something here. Well, I don't like it, but I'm going to call this x not y not. Okay. So now all my x's have to be x naughts, and I don't have any. Y's except the Y sub Y stars. And I wrote that incorrectly. Okay, I got a couple things wrong here. That's easy to fix. I have X minus XI. Okay. Okay, well, that's right. Now the yj star, a yi star, but that's not right. First of all, now my x should not be an x naught, and my yi star should be a y naught. There's no yi star involved in this. Thought of that when I was doing it. Apologies. That should have been my dot. That should be my dot. And this. Okay, so this becomes my dot. And then it's over. X dot minus X squared. Plus y naught squared. And now we'll integrate with respect to x. This is 3x. Okay, well, there's where the integral comes from. You're going to use a trig substitution to do the integral. I'm not going to go through the details because we're going to talk about a couple of configurations. And I think it will show you the details. Um, And I think that's going to be right. Now, infinite water.
trickier with the L's in here than it is if you get to take the limits. Okay. And you can do the same thing. If you have a question, why don't we talk about it? Okay. Now Okay. What I just had to do there is a lot easier. Mechanic engineers will understand this. Then what happens if 12 foot six by six happens to fall in my life? Okay. I'm a lot more careful with 12 foot six by six is an amnesty board. Uh, Something I have to deal with. Okay. Physics is that's interesting. Uh, so I'm going to do now <coughs> something very relevant. You got a loop, a circular loop with current in it. It's a magnetic field at the center of the loop. And what's a magnetic field at a point along the axis through the center? Because that's relevant to our animals clubs, isn't it? Okay. So let's say we have a loop. And I'm going to loop from the power spectrum. This is 10 inches. Okay, so it would be about to square us down like loop. It's one of my better efforts to see. Okay. Let's give a loop a radius of A. We got a current pi flowing in the counterclockwise traverse positive direction around the loop. <coughs> and take a typical loop. And we want the field at the set. What's our R vector? Well, here's the R vector. And here's the I delta L vector. It's the angle between these two vectors. Okay, just a little final point now. Here's your I, there's your I delta L. And they're both calculated from the sample point, which means, if you think about it, they, they are at right angles. You know what I said? The I delta L for this segment, though, isn't exactly what it would be when you calculate it at the sample point. The average of your I delta L is not going to be exactly what it is at your sample point. Okay? Even if your sample point happens to lie at the exact center of that hit group because of the curvature. Okay, the length of thing and the curvature and stuff. Uh, well, I better go ahead and 
detail to try to state that. Um, but if you draw it out, you can see. Okay, and it's worth doing, especially when, well, just worth doing to understand calculus. What happens though in the limit as you uh, take uh, your delta L's or your delta S's, okay? Uh, if you let all those delta S's approach zero, then every one of these little segments will get closer and closer to the straight line. And the endpoints of the segment are all going to be so close to the middle, it's not going to make any difference. Now, if you're going to do this rigorously, you've got to write out all the limiting expressions, okay? Uh, in physics, we usually don't get that rigorous in some applications. And you need to understand that. So you understand when you're being precise with your R. Although in engineering, usually, you know when you're close enough and close enough is what you're going to do with anything. <laughs> okay. Um, there are probably exceptions to that. I'm not an engineer, so I can't tell you for sure. Okay. Um, so, <coughs> That's an R hat, it's not the hat in there. It's okay. And it's not a plus, it's a cause. Well, that just comes out K prime I, build an L over R squared, multiplied by your K vector. Because L and your R vector are always at right angles, whatever increment you're talking about. Okay, so there it is. K prime I is still constant. K vector is constant. What's the sum of delta L over R squared? Well, what's the sum of your delta L's? Okay. Well, the sum of all your delta L's approaches your circumference. Now, a delta L is really a straight line that cuts a little arc here, right? Because this increment of the circle is a little bit of an arc, and a delta L is a straight line. But again, in the limit, the straight lines and the arcs approach the same thing. Okay? So that's 2 pi a. R is constant. R is always a. So this just becomes This, which is two pi k time i over a. Now, in the case of Helmholtz coil, that occurred about 0.4 amps, just from the battery with all its internal resistance, and. A was 10 centimeters, okay? 
So I, and as I used 0.4 inches, it's 10 centimeters, which is 0.1 meter. Okay, well, 2 pi times 0.4 is about somewhat over 0.2. You divide that by 0.1 to get 2. So you get about 2 times 10 to the negative 7, which isn't much. Okay? So one loop gives you something in the order of 10 to the negative seventh Tesla. The Earth's magnetic field is on the order of three times 10 to the negative fifth, approximately Tesla. It depends on where you are, and there's some fluctuations uh, in time also, depending on what's going on down there. So the Earth, you're not even sure of that. I know, but I'm told you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm no geophysicist either. Uh, if you multiply this by like 100 coils, though, you get something in the order of the Earth's magnetic field. Okay? Now you put a magnet in the middle there and orient this thing perpendicular to the Earth's magnetic field. I think that magnet is going to swing around more than 45 degrees, or the compass needle is going to swing around more than 45 degrees. Okay, I might set that up and do that eventually. Just so we can two minutes take it to put it. Uh, in any case, this allows you to calculate the magnetic field at the center of a loop. Now, the center of the coils is 10 centimeters along the axis of the loop to the center of the loop. Okay, so we have to do another. But I thought this is really neat for solids. So hopefully you will too. And I think you've seen the same thing with electric fields. So I don't think it's going to be a big surprise to you. So if I have the same loop, but at a point here. Now your book uses X for this coordinate. But I'm, I'm saying here's X, here's Y, and here's Z. So what happens at zero, zero, Z? Well, now your R vector Is a little longer, it's still perpendicular, which is nice. Your I delta L. If you look at the relevant picture, well, you see that R is doing it symbolically. Equals I don't want to write it out as a vector at this point because it's real short of time. I'll just do the latency of R. Right, G Z squared plus A squared is Z squared plus A squared. That should be obvious. You do a right triangle from here to the origin and then up to this point. So this leg of the triangle would be like A, this leg side would be like C, and there's no no more to it than that. Now, if our increment is here. This is A and C is this distance above the C 
plane. This, this picture will apply to any right hand coordinate system in this plane, it's rotated around the z axis, that whole curve. Um, then here's our R vector. Okay. I can't draw it very well, but if you remember when we did it for a ring, of charge, you got a field in this direction from an increment out of here, that there's an increment on the other side of the circle that would give you a field in this direction, and your ultimate field would be multiplied by the cosine of this angle. Now there's other stuff involved here, but I'm just going to say that the uh, You can read the details. The cosine would be I got the right cosine. And this gets multiplied by this. I'm not even sure I've written out correctly. Um, so I'll it. Yeah, it's here. So you're looking at something with this, other by this. Thinking of one day over it, it's for the basic work of C star. Uh, I'll leave that with a big question mark. You can read it. And simply, you write it all out with the actual vectors, which are easy to write. I just didn't want to write them all because of short time or a minute over. Uh, but that's how you get it. Okay. You also see the field of a sheet of charge, a sheet of current. Okay. Here's a sheet. Assume it's totally flat. Assume there's a current in it. Then what field do you get here? Okay, or what field do you get out here? Um, another interval. Um, and then what field if instead of a ring of charge, one of the, one of the interesting problems is if you have a uniformly charged disk and it's rotating. So you have charge moving around here. Charge on the rim is moving around at velocity omega a, right? Omega is your angular velocity. The charges closer to the center aren't moving as fast. So you divide this whole thing into little rings, each of which contributes this much field, okay? Except you're going to have to multiply your i times like the delta of r. And uh, we, we can do that. If we understand this, we understand this, there's quite a bit we can do. Uh, if we understand the line integral for the line charge, then essentially your sheet of charge is just a bunch of line charges. Okay? But there are different points in your vectors changing through that. So kind of be prepared to look at that next time. I also didn't do dipole, but I did that last time. So. Uh, and the alignment of the dipole with the magnetic field. Talk about that next. Okay.